Sure. Well, it's important to note that there was no roadmap in the beginning. Mm -hmm. So this is all looking back uh, yeah. in you know, retrospective. Mm -hmm. And what I realize now is that writing skills help make you an effective speaker. So paying attention to composition and the structure of writing mm -hmm. helps you organize your thoughts in any kind of a setting. Mm -hmm. So writing skills, okay. specifically kind of business writing skills, mm -hmm. uh, will help in public speaking. I also uh, took Toastmasters. I joined a Toastmasters mm -hmm. club uh, and learned a lot. I think the most powerful learning opportunity though was being a judge in Toastmasters, mm -hmm. having to provide critique and feedback to speakers. Mm -hmm. And then practice makes perfect. Mm -hmm. uh, getting, uh, securing a job where my uh, primary role was advocating, uh, raising money, raising awareness required by nature a lot mm -hmm. of speaking to small groups like Kiwanis groups, mm -hmm. um, uh, League of Women Voters, civic organizations, and over time uh, you get a feel for what people appreciate and um, what makes them zone out. What is it that they appreciate? What do you give them that they appreciate? Enthusiasm. So I try to avoid any public speaking about any topic that I'm not enthusiastic about. Mm. I'll decline public speaking events because I think that the best that you can bring to other people is the best of you. Mm -hmm. And if you are not engaged or interested, you're not going to be an effective spokesperson. Mm -hmm. So I think what I bring is enthusiasm for them. And then I try to do research ahead of time about the group so I understand what their interests are. Mm -hmm. A step that's easy to skip, but I would warn against it, mm -hmm. is not understanding why you, you were invited to speak. Was it the technical background? Was it because they have a friendly relationship with you? Or was it completely random? Mm -hmm. Or have they, in fact, invited the wrong person? So mm -hmm. do a lot of inquiry with the person who's invited, with either the organizer of the meeting or who's invited you. Mm -hmm. So you smile a lot. Yeah. Uh -huh. yes, uh, yes, I do. Um, <laughs> A again, I think that that's um, enthusiasm. Uh, I said yes to this engagement because I'm pretty passionate about teaching young people um, and mentoring young people. So I'm excited for you guys. You're going to have a great career. Thanks. Well, again, you have to go back and do that research. What is it that the audience wants as opposed to uh, to simply what you want to deliver. There has to be a compromise there. Mm -hmm. You may have a message or an agenda yourself, but mm -hmm. let's figure out what they need first. Um, I think all good things come in threes, and I try not to have any more than three messages. Mm -hmm. So there's an intro, which always um, is designed to engage the audience and thank them, acknowledge who they are, mm -hmm. what they need from me, so it's very audience focused. Mm -hmm. And then three key messages or points that I wanna make and then a conclusion that summarizes those three points and again, mm -hmm. ends with the audience. Mm -hmm. My favorite um, uh, uh, events are where you get to have audience interaction. Mm -hmm. Do you incorporate that intentionally into your speeches? Right? I try to negotiate that with whoever the organizer is, mm -hmm. um, leaving time for Q and A. Mm -hmm. and Anytime anybody's asked me to speak for longer than 10 minutes, I will always say, how about if we spend half of that time with formal remarks and half of the time with Q&A? Mm. I, I don't think it's, it's not possible for me to give a speech longer than 10 minutes. Hmm. Not possible? I don't, think it, I don't think I'm very effective at it. Oh, okay. Yeah. So you, you strive for conciseness, I guess, then? Yes, yeah. Okay. Well, I, I did that much more when I worked in the nonprofit sector where we were talking about clients uh, at the YWCA or in foster care, for example, or in criminal justice. Um, starting out with a story of a client um, told in the most respectful, confidential way, and, and it has to be authentic, it has to be real, uh, is a great way uh, to open up um, uh, the speech. And then in the closure, uh, talking about how what there's always a call to action for the audience. Mm -hmm. 
so there's a call to action and it's to do it for Melissa or to help Chris mm -hmm. and to remind them of that story again in the call to action. These days, I don't tell too many stories um, mm -hmm. and that's a good reminder. Maybe I should get back into that habit again. Uh, well, my own uh, personal interest, again, that goes back to enthusiasm and wanting to be authentic. I had taken a class on different learning styles, auditory, visual, et cetera, learning mm -hmm. styles. And um, I realized that I was an auditory learner. Mm -hmm. So I wrote a speech uh, with that in mind. I shared with the audience that, um, that uh, there are certain memories that are shaped based on your learning style. And I told them stories um, from my social services experience that were all based on um, auditory memories. And they were very, they were very sad stories. Mm -hmm very, very sad stories of children that I had worked with and their auditory memory that they left with me. Mm -hmm. um, and that made the stories better because they were all anchored in a theme. Mm -hmm. How did you know that that was successful? People asked me to give it again and again. Mm -hmm. People cried. Mm -hmm. People took action. Everybody that I can think of who's local has good days and bad days, <laughs> just like I do. So what I remember is the traits of out there speech, okay, not the particular sure. person. Mm -hmm. And I really admire people who are able to speak extemporaneously, or it mm -hmm. seems like they're speaking Present. extemporaneously, mm -hmm. and they don't need to refer to notes. Um, and for those who do have notes, I love it when they only have to look down occasionally. You can tell that they've just written prompts down for themselves so that they're able to spend lots of time with the audience. Um, yeah, I try to avoid being the speaker I wouldn't want to hear. <laughs> and I do the same thing politically, too. I try to be the elected official that I would want to vote for as opposed to what I think I need to be for people to vote for me. Does that mm -hmm. make sense? Mm -hmm. So I don't pay too much attention to the scientific methodology of speech giving. Mm -hmm. I try to be concise. I try to be enlivened, authentic, enthusiastic, mm -hmm. give some value to the person's day. They're contributing their time listening to me, mm -hmm. even if they asked me to come. Mm -hmm. So I do try to add value to their day and get down as quick as possible <laughs> because that's what I would like from a speaker. Um, and I, it seems to work. So. What are some of the things you've encountered that you think students might run into? Oh, holy cow. I just had one uh, a couple of days ago, in fact. Uh, I was invited to a get out the vote rally and they had a band and a stage and the organizers were very well organized. They wanted me to speak for 10 minutes, which is kind of my max. Um, and I was supposed to um, help improve the voter registration rates at this venue. Well, I got there and uh, it was in the middle of a cafeteria where uh, it was impossible to see who my audience was versus who was just there trying to eat lunch. <laughs> and so it was like you were crashing somebody's lunch. So uh, there, were, uh, there were probably 100, 150 people in the room. And um, I would say 125 of them were completely irritated to have this lady with the microphone interrupting their lunch. That is a good example of rolling with the punches. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you've just got to have a sense of humor about it. Um, I ended up, you know, throwing out prizes. Mm -hmm. And some of them actually stopped eating lunch and turned around and paid attention. Mm -hmm. But you just have to have a sense of humor and roll with it. Um, yeah. Speaking of Microphones humor. don't work. Mm -hmm. The person that's supposed to greet you isn't there. There's been a misunderstanding about how long you're supposed to speak or the topic. And again, you've just got to have a sense of humor. And don't, don't tell the story to the audience. Don't tell that. Don't say, well, gee, I was invited to speak for five minutes. I understand I'm supposed to speak for 20. You don't need to share that with mm -hmm. the audience. Mm -hmm. um, uh, they don't care. You don't want to embarrass your hosts. And you don't want to look flubbed up. So mm -hmm. I, I try to use it a lot, but I don't construct it. Um, 
generally it will be um, laughing at my laughing at myself. Um, um, Can you give an example? No. Um, I have a droll sense of humor, so when I talk about some of the adventures in elections and some of the um, uh, some of the mistakes that candidates or um, voters make when they're completing their ballots, for example, mm -hmm. without making fun of them, I, I I just try to make it try to make it humorous. Okay. Um, yeah. Last year, I was at a national conference of county officials, and it was in Washington, D.C. We heard a lot from White House officials, the executive branch. And most of them, you could tell, were doing a dog and pony show, basically whatever script the White House had written out for their department head. Mm -hmm. But one fellow who was the director of um, agriculture uh, came out and What was so good about that speech? One, he had mastery of the content. He knew it inside and out. Two, he was really passionate. He wasn't just delivering a message from the White House. He was, he was urging the audience to action. Um, he started by describing the soulful salt of the earth people who make their livelihood um, from agriculture, um, some of the small farmers, the small business owners, and how impending legislation would end up hurting them. So we started out where you could really relate to your own hometown, mm -hmm. those small agriculture farmers. Um, and then he spoke in very clear and simple terms um, what the legislation was and what it would do and how important it was um, to take action. Sure. Um, first of all, I'd encourage them to do it. Uh, it builds courage doing that, and it builds your confidence. Uh, I would also suggest that the first few times that you do it, that you specifically plant somebody in the audience who will give you a critique afterwards, mm -hmm. and also plant somebody in the audience who will ask you a question, because sometimes it's hard to get the room started. You need to be comfortable redirecting questioners. Uh, oftentimes, too often, people will grab the mic and they'll give a speech instead of a question. And um, you, you, if the moderator's not going to do it, you need to kind of regain control for the sake of the rest of the audience, not for you. Um, so I'd encourage you to do it. And if you don't know, if you're not confident in your answer, my advice is that you say, um, I know I read that report, but I'm just not feeling sharp enough to answer that question. Mm -hmm. Can I get the answer back through your president mm -hmm. for your next meeting? Mm -hmm. Or I will email that to you. But don't, if you truly don't know an answer, don't make one up. And y there's 101 ways that you can rehearse ahead of time how you're going to respond to a question that you don't know the answer to. So have that in your hip pocket and practice how you're going to say, I don't know, in a way that is comfortable for you. Yeah. Speaking of practicing, do you practice when you're speaking? I do not. Hmm. Okay. No. I, because I don't have time. So mm -hmm. I, I know that that's a good practice. I try to be prepared for my speeches. Mm -hmm. So I try to do that research. I spend time with the moderator. Um, about the venue, their expectations, who they are. I also try to always do an outline and maybe get the freshest statistics for a point that I'm trying to make. So I do some research, I try to do an outline, um, and, that, and that's it. <laughs> well, I, I'm, sure, I'm sure that I would, my speaking would be improved if I took the time to practice. Mm -hmm. Well, the content really drives the event and the speech. Uh, I'm asked most often to talk about elections, and holy cow, there is so much content there. Always there's breaking news. Always there's hot questions. So I'm never at a loss for words or content, and man, there's nothing that makes speaking better than having, having that. Um, I would 
stay focused on the audience. And again, um, even if you don't care about it, you've got an audience that's sitting there that has to listen to you, whether they want to or not. So how are you going to make it as pleasurable and enjoyable for them as possible? Be the speaker that you would want to listen to, even if the content isn't of your choosing. So that's the primary thing. What, what would you want from a speaker in this situation? I bet you cover this in your class. There will be times, as many years as I've done public speaking on TV to large audiences, small audiences, every now and then for some unknown reason, I will be struck by fear and nervousness and get very uh, nervous. Uh, always have a contingency plan because it will happen to you sometimes. Uh, have a contingency plan about how you are going to settle yourself. And I have found that that deep, deep breaths before you take the stage or before you stand up is uh, absolutely worth it. And don't, don't be rushed. Don't be rushed. Take the time to gather your thoughts if you stumble, if you're nervous. Be calm and gather yourself up. One of the things that's most fun is delving into a speech of a controversial topic. Um, as the elected auditor, the buck stops here, and I'm responsible for many decisions that are either misunderstood or make people very unhappy. And being responsible for that decision and having to um, present it be accountable to it and answer people's questions and listen to their anger or their curiosity is actually a high. It's not something that I shy away from because once you live through it, you know that you can do it and um, nothing will make you a better speaker than doing that Q&A on a topic that is unpopular and that you're responsible for. Mm -hmm. So I think everybody should look forward to that opportunity. Mm -hmm. I recently attended an Aikido class uh, and one of the first lessons I learned was that your primary responsibility is to love and protect your attacker. Mm -hmm. So when you're in public service and you're accountable to citizens, whether it's because they're confused or frustrated, your duty is to be responsible and no matter what mud they sling at you, your duty is to love and protect them. Mm 